UFC Vegas 68 betting and DraftKings show. We have 12 fights this late Saturday night coming up at 10 p.m. Eastern this weekend. I'm John Kelly, breaker of change, killer of late swap. Let's hear the picks. Kicking things off in the flyweight division, we have Tatsuro Tyra coming in as the biggest favorite on the card at minus 1150. The comeback on debutante fighter Jesus Aguilar is plus 750. And we'll start on the Aguilar side because some of you may not recognize the name. He actually fought on this past season of Dana White's Contender Series. Looked okay in that spot. He did come through as a small betting underdog. Um, But really the skill set, I have some concerns at the UFC level. For starters, he's very undersized. Even at the flyweight division, he's very short, got very short arms. Tatsuro Tyra is going to be massively bigger than him in there. He's going to be working with like a six-inch reach advantage. He's just going to be the bigger, stronger of the two. Whereas Aguilar, his his style is more of a grappler, right? Like he goes to the takedowns. He seems to have a decent guillotine choke. That's one of his best weapons. But really, he's going to be outclassed in just about every area on the mat with Tatsuro Tyra, who I also think is the better striker of the two as well. I expect him to mix in the leg kicks, but I do expect these boys to grapple, and that's where I see the biggest advantage for Tyra. I expect him to be the one landing takedowns, him to be the one out scrambling, beating Aguilar to the positions, and potentially finding a finish on the mat as well. So Tatsuro Tyra by submission, that's the official pick. And he's one of the safer options on DraftKings as well. Next fight up in the middleweight division, Jung Young Park comes in as a minus 215 favorite. The comeback on Dennis Ty is plus 185. And this is one that I do have some interest in both from a betting standpoint and on DraftKings, because I am expecting a finish here. And you see the under two and a half is priced around a pick them right now. I think Either of these guys are live for a finish here. Ty Lulin, he's basically a one-dimensional power puncher. Nine of his 10 career wins have come by knockout. He's coming off a knockout win over Jamie Pickett in his last fight. And then on the flip side, Jung Young Park is not really known as a finisher, but we saw as recent as his last fight against Joseph Holmes where he was able to get that submission finish. He is capable of doing that when he has a grappling advantage. And that's what I expect here. You know, Jung Young Park's a very well-rounded fighter, decent pace on the feet, but he's able to mix in those takedowns. He averages over two takedowns per 15 minutes. And Ty Lulin historically cannot defend takedowns very well, and he can be out grappled. We've seen that across his career on the regional scene. He's been submitted in three of his six professional losses. So it's just one where if Ty Lulin wins, it probably comes from him clipping Park early and getting him out of there. And if Park wins, I think it comes from heavy grappling where I think he'll have at least an opportunity or two to pull off a finish on the mat. So give me Park by submission. That's the official pick. I like the unders here. So I'm going to have exposure to both sides on DraftKings. Which brings us to our next fight as Gian Kim comes in as a minus 275 favorite. The comeback on Mandy Bohm is plus 230. And for starters, I'm not sure that Gian Kim should be this big of a favorite against almost anybody in the UFC, so I'm not going to fault anyone for taking the dog shot on Mandy Bone. The reason why I'm not personally is because she's really bad. Um, she started her career 7-0, and looked okay on the German regional scene, comes to the UFC, loses to Ariana Lipsky, pretty much gets dominated, and then loses to Victoria Leonardo, very low-level fighter. Um, that was really kind of a red flag for me, and she just doesn't seem to do a lot. Low volume on the feet. Doesn't really look to grapple. Can't really defend takedowns either. Fortunately for her, I do think she's going to get a striking match because Gian Kim never looks to grapple. And another positive note on the Bohm side is that Gian Kim fights basically everybody to a close fight, whether she's an underdog or a favorite because of her fighting style. You know, she keeps a decent volume and pace on the feet in the striking, but she is hittable. And I just think a lot of her rounds are just super razor thin. And that's why you see her in so many split decisions up and down her her record. And now she's lost five of her last six fights. So she's not somebody that you can trust. I bet her against Jocelyn Edwards as a dog. I thought she pretty much gave away that fight. Very winnable fight for her. I just don't really trust her. Now, if you were going to put money on this fight and where I actually am a little bit tempted, you know, my head is telling me pass. I don't want any part of this. But my heart is telling me Jiyeon Kim is the more skilled fighter and really should win rounds here against Mandy Bohm. The decision prop on FanDuel is minus 120 relative to DraftKings, which is minus 150. So a little bit of line value there. You're basically just turning Kim, who's a chalky favorite, and getting her at almost a pick because I would be surprised if she finishes here. She's not known as a finisher. Mandy Bohm's never been finisher in her career. So I think if you are 
going to have action. I think that would be be the way to do it. Kim by decision. In terms of DraftKings, I have zero interest in Gian Kim, even in a win, even if she convincingly wins, which she never basically does. But even in that scenario, she's not paying off a 9K price tag. I have a hard time seeing how she has any sort of ceiling at that price. Whereas on the flip side, Mandy Bohm, she just needs to win. You know, this is a card where we don't have a lot of standout value. If Mandy Bohm just wins and doesn't score great, but puts up like 70 points in a striking base decision, that might be enough at 7,200, assuming none of those other cheap underdogs come through. So in terms of DraftKings, I'll have zero G on Kim, but I will have some exposure to Bohm as a cheap underdog that just needs to win in order to be relevant for this slate. And up next, we have the first of four Road to UFC finals here. That's why this card is so late it's catering to the asian market and we have four of these road to ufc tournament finals on this card so i understand a lot of people aren't going to recognize these names I honestly didn't recognize a lot of these names either, but I have dug into the tape, did some research on these guys. Not quite as much as I would for Dana White Contender Series, just because there's a little bit less footage to go off of, at least for me. But I do think there is the potential for an edge this week, and especially when it comes to DraftKings, because there are so many unknowns on a lot of these fighters. So let's get into it. The first one's in the flyweight division. Hyung Sung Park comes in as a minus 190 favorite. The comeback on Sing Guk Choi is plus 160. And we'll start on the Park side. He's a 7-0 prospect. Six of his seven wins have come inside the distance. Most of those have been inside the first round, including his fight on road to UFC. And he seems to be kind of awkward on the feet, but the natural athleticism and power is certainly clear. And most of his fights, he's kind of just, you know, lacking technique, but really just kind of manhandling his opponents and big brothering them until he puts them in bad spots on the mat and gets them out of there. On the flip side, Senguk Choi, I think, is a more well-rounded fighter to start out with. Now, he is going to be a little bit undersized in terms of how big Park is here. So there could just be a, a real noticeable athleticism gap here and, and strength gap. So we'll have to keep an eye on weigh-ins. But I do actually think Choi is the more well-rounded of the two. I think he's a better overall striker, more diverse striker, has a lot more weapons. I expect him to just be the more active of the two. And Choi has also shown the ability to go for takedowns himself. He landed multiple takedowns in his last fight. Three of them, I believe, and he did go to decision in both of those fights. So I think if if he can survive the early onslaught from Park here, and this does go the full 15 minutes, I think there's a case for Choi to be the more active of the two, considering Park's cardio is pretty much unproven. And I just expect Choi to be doing more as the fight goes on, potentially take over late. So we're actually going to go with the dog here. Choi by decision is the official pick. Which brings us to our next fight in the bantamweight division as Rinya Nakamura comes in as a minus 425 favorite. The comeback on Toshiyama Kazuma is plus 340. And this is another one where Nakamura is very inexperienced, only six professional fights, but four of which have come inside the distance. He ended both of his road to UFC bouts inside the first round. I think the strength, the power is clearly there. Another guy that kind of lacks the technical ability, but does have raw power, raw strength, raw skill. And you see him swinging wildly. If he's able to connect, the power is certainly there. So he does have knockout upside. He has shown the ability to land takedowns as well. Very aggressive on the mat. Now he's going to be facing a guy in Kazuma who's kind of a specialist. This guy's known as a grappler, only had one road to UFC fight, did win a decision as an underdog there. Now his wrestling is not very good and he's not super aggressive in getting the fight to the mat, but if he is able to get it to the mat, the grappling is good. He's a former IBJJF Asian Open winner as a purple belt. He now holds a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He does have some capable submissions off his back. So there is some reason to be concerned with Nakamura, an inexperienced power front running guy as a big favorite here. I think in terms of DraftKings, this is the one that I'm really keying in on as one that I want to be overexposed to because I think Nakamura has early knockout upside and Kazuma is another one of those really cheap underdogs where if he wins, he has the potential to break the slate here. I think he can make it a dog fight, but only if he can survive that first round, which I'm not convinced that he will. So the official pick is going to be Nakamura by knockout and he's a strong play on DraftKings. Next up in the featherweight division as Zhang Long Li 
Li comes in as a minus 250 favorite. The comeback on Zha Li is plus 210. And we'll start on the Zhang Li side. He is a very dangerous striker. Nine and one professional record. Five wins have come by first round knockout. And that's clear. That's his best path to victory, right? We saw in the road to UFC fights, he ended both of those guys inside the first round. He He's just going to go rabies from the jump and try to take your head off. And the power is certainly there. Now on the flip side, Ja Li is a much more experienced fighter, 21 and three record. He's more of a grappler. I'd say his striking is very basic, rudimentary, not great, but not terrible either. But it's clear that his best path to victory is to get this fight to the ground. He landed multiple takedowns across both his his Uf, road to UFC fights. He averages on just that two-fight sample over eight takedowns per 15 minutes. So we can expect him to be aggressive in getting this fight to the mat. Ten submission victories on his record. I do think that's a clear advantage for him here. But he's another guy. He needs to be able to stay conscious and weather that early storm before he can drag Lee into deeper waters and potentially take over late. So this is another one, and it's kind of a theme with these road to UFC bouts where the big favorite certainly has early knockout ability, but they're facing somebody that might be better at them when you include all of the mixed martial arts. And on top of that, they're kind of unproven when dragged into deep waters later in fight. So again, I'm really going to be looking to target both sides of this matchup because I'm not ignoring the early finishing potential by Lee. But I also have interest in the dog because I really think at least one of these cheap underdogs are going to come through and be that potential slate breaker. And it could be Ja Lee. Which brings us to our fourth and final finale of the road to UFC bouts as Anshul Jubilee comes in as a small favorite at minus 120. The comeback on Jekka Saragi is plus 100. And this is one where I definitely have some interest from a DraftKings perspective, but I also have some interest in potentially betting on Saragi here. I think he's the more powerful of the two by a significant margin. And Jubilee really only had one road to UFC fight, came in as an underdog there, fought like a favorite, looked okay in that spot, but he's really known as being more of a grappler on the Indian regional scene, but most of that came against a very low level of competition. As you saw in his road to UFC bout, he wasn't really pushing the grappling and really didn't have any success in that area. So he was happy to stand and trade and his boxing is not bad offensively. He works the body well. He seems to have a little bit of power as well. This dude has zero defense on the feet. And a lot of these guys don't have great defense, but he's the one that stood out to me overextending himself in combinations, leaving himself wide open to counters. We got we saw him get tagged with the left hook repeatedly in that fight as well. And now he did win a split decision there, but I don't expect him to have grappling success against Jekka Siragi. And I think Siragi has real power. We saw the two highlight reel knockouts in his road to UFC fights. He was the guy that landed that highlight reel spinning back fist knockout. And I just think he's gonna be the much more dangerous power puncher of the two. And while he's reckless, I think he's just a little bit sharper, at least defensively, in terms of the striking than Jubilee. So I think Jubilee's going to eat a lot of big shots here, and I think he's potentially going to sleep. So give me Jekka Siragi by knockout. That's the official pick. Which brings us to the first fight on the main card as Yusako Kinoshita comes in as a minus 325 favorite. The comeback on Adam Fugit is plus 270. And Kinoshita is a guy who fought on this past season of Dana White Contender Series. And I had some questions about him going into that spot. I believe I actually bet on the bigger Henrique in that spot. And it ended up going poorly for me um, because Kinoshita won by third round knockout there. And it's clear he does have power. You know, he's ended most of his fight inside the first round. I believe it's five of his seven wins have come by knockout, majority of which have come early. But coming into that fight, like he had never fought anybody really worth anything on the Japanese regional scene. I I remember when I initially did research on him, he had never fought anybody under like 38 years old or something crazy like that. And his last fight prior to Contender Series came against some some dude that was over 40 years old, complete bum, complete nobody. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't have any skills. It's clear he has the power. I just think he's relatively unproven, and I think there's a lot of hype behind this guy. I get it. He's knocking people out. He looks fun, whatever. But I think Adam Fugit is being slept on in terms of the betting market here. Fugit's a guy who historically has kind of always been counted out and been an underdog came in over an LFA short notice knocked out Solomon Renfro another guy who had a lot of hype behind him 
Didn't end up panning out being as good as quite some people thought, but it was still a big win for Fugit and one of his best across his career. But the kid's very well-rounded. We saw him make his UFC debut on short notice against Michael Morales, where, again, people were counting him out. He gave a pretty decent account of himself, even landed a takedown there, one of eight on takedowns. He does come from a high school wrestling background, holds a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he comes from a Muay Thai striking background, and he's going to be working with a six-inch reach advantage. So he's going to be the longer of the two. I think he's the more well-rounded of the two, and I actually think there's a clear grappling path to victory for him here. Kinoshita's gra- de- defensive grappling and cardio is pretty much completely untested. I think there's clearly a world where Fugit can land multiple takedowns here and, and really test Kinoshita like we haven't seen him tested. Now, the obvious thing is, is Fugit has been knocked out before. We know he likes to throw a lot of those body kicks, head kicks, leaves himself open to counters, and Kinoshita is a very powerful counter striker. So there is going to be an opportunity for Kinoshita to clip him and hurt him. I'm just betting on Fugit as the underdog to be able to avoid those spots and potentially grind this dude on the mat and really force him to answer some questions for me. So I like Fugit as the underdog here. I'm going with Fugit by submission. Next fight up, we have Duho Choi coming in as a minus 180 favorite. The comeback on Kyle Nelson is plus 155. And this one, there's definitely red flags on both sides. For starters, on the Duho Choi side, we haven't seen him fight since 2019 when he got knocked out by Charles George. He is now on a three-fight losing streak and coming off over a three-year layoff. So those are some obvious concerns, and there were some injuries there as well. But this is a guy who I don't want to lose faith on in terms of his upside because we know historically he's billed as a power puncher. 11 of his 14 wins have come by knockout, and prior to the three-fight losing streak that he's been on, he had three straight first round finishes. So we know the upside is there. The power is there if he's able to get that first round finish. So I think at 8,600, he's kind of one of my favorite plays on DraftKings because I think maybe the field won't trust the upside like I do, especially coming off the long layoff here. We'll see how the sentiment around him plays out throughout the rest of the week before we get a gauge on ownership. But I do think Duho Choi, at least the upside, is certainly there in the upper mid-range at 8,600 against Kyle Nelson, who I just want no part of. This dude is now dropping back to 145, did not look good there previously in the past, has only won one of his five UFC bouts, and that was against Marco Polo Reyes, who he knocked out, who's known to really not be able to take a punch. So he just, he really doesn't have many tools here for Duho Choi. And and I think just cutting that extra 10 pounds, again, moving back to 145, it's just going to make him gas out even quicker. He looked gassed out against Jai Herbert when he lost his last fight as well. So I just, I don't really see a path for Kyle Nelson here. And I think Duho Choi is powerful enough to overwhelm him early and clip him and get him out of there. So Duho Choi by knockout, that's the official pick. Which brings us to our first of two heavyweight bouts as Marcin Tybora comes in as a minus 135 favorite with Blagoy Ivanov on the comeback at plus 115. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. I don't really like this matchup. I don't really like a lot of these like sloppy heavyweight matchups, especially on the main card. Fortunately, I'll be fast asleep because I'm not staying up till 3 a.m. or whatever to watch Marcin Tybora top time Blagoy Ivanov. And I think that's what happens here. I think on the feet, Tybora is able to keep a good enough pace to where I think this is going to be even on the feet. And Ivanov just never really impresses me. You know, the gas tank, I think, favors Tybora. Uh, the durability probably favors Ivanov, but I just expect there to be a grappling edge here. Tybora averages around one and a half takedowns per 15 minutes. I expect him to mix in the grappling here, and that's where I think he can swing rounds is with takedowns, with top time. So I got Marcin Tybora winning a decision here. Not a ton of interest on DraftKings because I mentioned a lot of fights already where I think a finish is pretty likely, and I'm just going to look to target those, whereas this one I think is going to be a boring, sloppy, heavyweight decision. Which brings us to the co-main event as Da Eun Jung comes in as a minus 240 favorite. The comeback on Devin Clark is plus 200, and I favor Da on Jung here. I think he's going to have a clear striking advantage, a clear power advantage. 11 of his 14 wins have come by knockout. He's known as a power puncher and he keeps a decent pace on the feet as well. The problem with Jung is that when he's not getting those early finishes and somebody's able to go toe to toe with him in the striking, maybe try to implement the grappling as well, he seems kind of unsure of of what to do and and the cardio seems to be maybe a concern as well so he's not like this super trustworthy guy but I do think it clearly favors him against 
Devin Clark, who's comes from a collegiate wrestling background, but he's really never aggressive enough or not as aggressive as you want him to be in pursuing the takedowns. Averages around two per 15 minutes. But Dalton Jung has historically shown solid takedown defense. I expect him to stuff a lot of the Devin Clark attempts, which means we might just see a lot of Clark trying to hold Jung up against the fence, which makes me kind of shy away from this fight from a DraftKings perspective. But I do think if Jung is able to to stuff those takedowns like I expect, find enough space against Devin Clark, then I do think the knockout will materialize. Devin Clark's sort of known as a quitter, been finished in six of his seven professional losses. So Don Jung by knockout is the official pick, but I think it might come a little bit later and I think he might underperform on drafting. So I'm going to look to come in underweight to the field in this one. Which brings us to our heavyweight main event as Sergey Spivak, the polar bear, comes in as a minus 230 favorite. The comeback on Derek, the black beast, Lewis, is plus 195. And this is one where... I definitely have more interest than the Tybora heavyweight fight that we talked about earlier because this one, I think, a finish is super likely, really on both sides, because obviously Derek Lewis, nobody's going to underrate the punching power. Most knockouts in UFC history, he really just has that kill shot against anybody. He's able to find that. Now, Sergey Spivak is a guy who has won five of his last six fights. He's been pretty impressive. His striking is not great, but it's serviceable enough to maintain distance before he closes in and goes to the takedowns, implements the grappling, where I think he has a clear advantage over a lot of people in this division, including Derek Lewis himself, who, yes, he's been able to just power up and get up when other guys have taken him down in the past, and maybe he's able to do that once or twice here, but I just think the pace and the relentless pressure of Sergey Spivak is going to be the difference here. It's only a matter of time before Derek Lewis, things start going bad. We know he looks for a way out of there. He's kind of a quitter. He's been knocked out seven times in his career, so I, I think the durability is just as much of a concern on the Lewis side as it is on the Spivak side. Now, it doesn't mean Lewis can't win because the two times we did see Spivak knocked out was by Tom Aspinall in the first round and Walt Harris, who bombed on him in his UFC debut back in 2019. So certainly Lewis is capable of finding that kill shot, but I just, I I have some doubts. I think the grappling is going to be the difference here. Sergey Spivak, finds a finish on the mat. That's the official pick. And as always, you can check out fightnumbers.com where I'll have DraftKings player rankings broken down by salary tier. I'll have ownership projections as well, which should be more accurate now that there's no longer late swap. And as always, guys, appreciate you watching. Best of luck, and we'll see you next time.